Word of God. And we are going through the book of Revelation. And uh, so we are in Revelation chapter 4 today. So turn there. There's pew Bibles. There are, uh, that we'll have it on the screen as well. So Revelation chapter 4. But before we even read it, I want to help give you a few points to help guide your reading of it. Uh, because this is kind of one of the key visions of the book of Revelation for you in this last days here. Um, every vision is important, but interestingly, every other vision that we'll see from the rest of Revelation to the end, it hinges on this vision. So it's one of the most important. And so it's for us, so I want you to have this in your pocket. So listen attentively and search it with your heart and your mind as we read it, because it's meant to uh, prepare you for these times that you're living in today in this moment. So let me read this to get, uh, with you, for you, and then we'll pray and then look at it together. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take pl place after this. At once, I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were seven, were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him, who is seated on the throne, and worship him, who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let's ask for his help understanding and applying it. Lord God, we pray by your Spirit that you would Teach us and lead us as we're in your midst this morning. Lord, open our ears to hear. Give us ears to hear your voice, our good shepherd, as you lead us and teach us and sharpen us and transform us. Amen. Amen. So every time uh, James Bond goes on a mission, he always, before the mission, something happens. He, every time, meets with Q to get his gadgets for the mission. And Q has always thought ahead about the mission he'll be going on. So if it's underwater, he'll usually have some kind of underwater breathing device. Uh, if he's going out in the desert where he could get lost, you know, his watch has a GPS tracker in it. So like that was a fantasy back then. Now all of our watches have GPS or a lot of them. Uh, but the, the, what you're given is tailored to your mission. And we find the exact same thing here. Our mission as followers of Christ in these last days, the first and second coming, uh, our mission is given this gadget or this tool to support us in it. And so we're going to study and break it down. And when you do, there seems to be three 
entities that are the focus of this passage. There is the Father on the throne. There is the four creatures. And there are the the 24 elders. And so those are the main aspects we're going to look at. Uh, I expect this sermon to leave you with more questions than answers because there is just no way we could break down uh, every, every little detail of this passage. But we'll try. So it's more of an overview. So I would love, if you have questions after this, at any point during the week, after the service today, that you want to ask me or, or put by me, or please do. I want to invite you to dialogue with me on this as we go through. So let's look together at the first part here and see what it says to, to us. The Lord on his throne. So if you remember, the first vision that we started with was Jesus standing in the midst of his lampstands. Seven lampstands, standing in the midst of his churches. He's near, he's present. Well, this is the exact opposite of that vision. The Lord wanted his people to see him near for what he had to say then. The Lord wants to see his people to see him in a totally different position. Now, instead of on earth, he is in heaven He's far, he's transcendent, he's all glorious. So listen to this text as we read it together. This uh, verse 2 here. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. So it's now in heaven, and there's one seated on the throne. And we believe that this is God the Father because we see references later on to the seven spirits, which are the Holy Spirit. And in the next chapter, which is part of this vision, we'll see the Lamb. And so that's the Son. So this is the Father on his throne. Now, it seems obvious to say this, but what is the Lord showing us about himself in this image? We see a throne. That's how he wants you to picture him in heaven, is on a throne. Now, throne uh, conjures up images of authority, of power, like a king. So essentially, he wants you to see him as the king of the universe in this vision. But not just an old, doddering king with gray hair slumped over his throne like we would see in some kingdoms. He wants you to see him as he truly is, which is a glorious king. And so what he begins to do in this vision is show himself in this radiant, dazzling glory. Look what he says here. The first thing he says is that uh, he has the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And these are two incredibly precious stones. So uh, we think that jasper is like essentially diamond. So he's shining like a diamond, and carnelian is this deep red stone, diamond, this precious stone here. And so think about this. I mean, already, when you see a huge engagement ring, there's normally a gasp. From the women, usually, the gasp, the gasp is because of how beautiful that giant stone is. <gasps> For the men, it's usually a gasp because they're thinking of how much it costs. <laughs> But either way, there's a gasp, because to see that, even if you recognize how much it costs, if that's why you're thinking of it, uh, you're still stunned by it. You're still engaged by it. It's glorious. And the Lord is saying that he on his throne is like full, radiant of this glory, this glory of this engagement ring. It's like seeing a 10,000 carat uh, Lord upon his throne, glorious. In all of his glory. Uh, There's more. He says next that there around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So this green stone, a rainbow though. I mean, uh, on the best days, you can see even a double rainbow. And it's glorious. It's cool. It's uh, worth stopping for and looking at at its beauty. Uh, So we see more beauty and more glory. He continues though. He wants you to see more Uh, there are 24 other thrones around his throne with elders on them. And we'll look at those in a second 
point, but just to see here that he is positioning himself as the king amongst all other kings and authorities. So he is the most authoritative, the centrally king here. Uh, He continues, though. He wants you to see that there are flashes of lightning and rumbling and peals of thunder around him. And this is a direct reference back to Mount Sinai when God's people uh, met with the Lord on top of that mountain, and they were absolutely terrified. I mean, it's what you feel when a hurricane passes over and you have no idea what's going to happen. There's raw power in a hurricane, but there is utter power in the Lord here. So he's not only dazzlingly glorious like stones and rainbows, but he's also supremely powerful, utter power. He wants you to see more. Uh, The second part of verse 5 continues, And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. So here is the Holy Spirit, fullness in number seven, surrounding and uh, in the midst of the throne in front of him. So we get some temple language there of the seven burning torches. So the Lord is not only powerful, dazzling, but he's also holy uh, because there's, there's this temple language that he is sitting in the most holy of holies here, surrounded by these torches. And then finally we read of the sea here, a sea as it were, a, a sea of glass like crystal. Now there's uh, a number of good ideas about what it means, and this is one of those points where people can uh, agree to disagree because there's multiple things it's pulling on here. In one sense, it's pulling on, or it could be pulling on, the idea from the Old Testament of an expanse. So the Lord is separated, like the expanse in the waters above and the waters below. The Lord is separate from the earth. He's above it all. There's a sea, an expanse before him. Uh, Other people have looked at the use of the sea in the Old Testament as this place of chaos. This is where the beasts will step out of the sea. And here they're thinking that maybe this is the Lord seeing the sea, but instead of tumultuous and anything coming out of it, it's still, it's serene. He stills the enemy and the avenger. But either way, it adds to this picture of glory, glory, glory. Holy, holy, holy. Now, this sometimes happens as a pastor when you're reading things. You come across a a really good quote, and in the moment you think, I'll write that down later. And then you don't, and then you can't find it again. That happened this week. But I'll give you the gist of the quote. And I don't even know who it was, so it's anonymous. Uh, what this person pointed out about this picture of the Lord in the center of all of these circles is this. This is a statement that the Lord is in the center of all things, not us. And his point was that we as humans tend to put ourselves in the center. We tend to put ourselves in the center of our own lives. We're the main character of our lives, and everything else revolves around us. But the Lord is putting himself Here in the center, he's showing himself as the true center of everything else in heaven and on earth. But specifically, specifically for his people who were in the first century, there's one person in particular that the Lord in this vision wanted them to think about as they saw the Lord on his throne in the center. There's one person in particular who at that time would put himself in the center of all things. There's one person in particular who sat on a throne and was surrounded by gold and riches and precious stones, who was surrounded by lesser authorities at the time, uh, and even in his presence could seem to the common person to be divine. Uh, Scholars have noted that this passage, and really the whole book of Revelation, takes on what they call a counter-imperial tone. The Lord is showing them the true king upon his throne because all they could see before this vision was Caesar on his throne. And that meant two things for them. They could not see the Lord on his throne yet before this vision, so all they could see was the dazzling glory and splendor and authority and power of Caesar. They could see that. 
And even uh, at the time, one of the Caesars, Domitian, uh, had, he wrote a letter to his people, uh, his servants, and he said, when you write letters to other people in your official business, I want you to tell it that it's from me. You're acting on my behalf. And I want you to begin your letters to other people that you write to them with this. Our Lord and God commands so-and-so. When Caesar speaks, he wanted his people to understand him as Lord and God. That's who they saw. And there would have been two temptations for a, a believer in that time period. One of them would have been to see the glory, the dazzling, absolute power of Caesar, and to serve him. Either because you're dazzled by his power and you think that he can give you what you need, the safety, the protection, the finances, so you're tempted to serve him because of that, or because you fear him and you say, well, I can't beat him. Who could beat that glorious king with all authority and power? So I might as well join him. But here, the Lord gives this vision to his believers in that century so that they would be taken, not with the glory of Caesar, but with the glory of the Lord upon his throne. The second temptation would have been to be in despair. And let me put it this way. Uh, we have an election upcoming, and it, it might be interesting what happens in our nation. Uh, depending on who takes the throne, uh, for you, it could either be a very exciting thing or a very despairing thing. If your preferred candidate gets in power, you could be taken by the promise that they have given. You could be taken by great expectations and begin to put more of your hope in that throne than this throne. And so in this image, this vision for us today, as we're living in the last days, the same last days as John, we are meant to see this picture of the Lord on his throne and to be taken by him and his glory to remember that. Or if your preferred candidate does not get in and the country continues to decline, which it will no matter who is in power in this election, as the country continues to decline, to have despair and to think there's no one on the throne. There's, it's chaos. There's uh, no order or structure. It's just these small parties fighting for power and glory. You need to see this same image of the Lord on his throne, ruling, guiding all things. So the Lord in his glory. One of the quotes I did remember to write down and note was this. To those who must live under the shadow of Caesar's throne and find that that shadow is made darker even by the shadow of Satan's throne, the one truth that matters above all others is that there is a greater throne above. The Lord is on his throne. That is what you need to see this morning. The Lord is on his throne. Make use of this vision. Remember it. Go back to it and read it this week to remember that the Lord is on his throne and he is glorious. So that is the first main entity of this passage, but the second is this, the four creatures. So this is where it kind of gets weird in Revelation, and it should. It's apocalyptic. It's meant to, to strike us and catch us off guard. So look in verse 6 as we read this. Around the throne and on each side of the throne, there are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind, the first like a lion, the second like an ox, the third like a man, the fourth like an eagle, and the four creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. What is going on here in this passage? What is, why does he draw attention to these elders, both here and later on in the passage? Uh, it's funny when even someone like John Calvin says, Now if anyone asks whether this vision is clear, I confess its obscurity and that I can scarcely understand it. But yet, into what God has set before us, it's not only right, but necessary to learn. Even if we only skim the surface of what God wills, yet it's significant. I agree. So what are these creatures, and what are they doing? All right, so this would have, for first century Jews, been an immediate flashback to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, where there are 
a, there's a similar vision given to Ezekiel of four creatures and these same four animals here. Uh, and we see that these are kind of like the king of the animals, the rulers of the animal world. You've got a lion, and everyone knows that's the king of the jungle. Uh, you've got an eagle, which would be the king of the air. You've got an ox, which would have been the king of all the domesticated animals, so it's larger and stronger than all the sheep and goats and that sort of thing. And then you have man, who is the king of all those animals. But essentially, you have represented here every kind of creature on earth. The fish got a short shake. They didn't get a cherubim here. But we're meant to understand here, as we're trying to ask what this is, we see that it it's, has to do with earthly creatures. And yet, we're also told in this passage that they are heavenly beings. They have wings, uh, they fly, and those are usually in these visions to communicate that uh, they are able to fly around the earth to do the will of the Lord. They are angelic. They have eyes all within and around, which means as they fly around to all the earth, they see everything for the Lord on behalf of the Lord. And so what, what we seem to be seeing here is this. And this is a strange idea to me, but here it is. These seem to be angelic beings, but that represent and oversee all of the creatures on earth. So they are shaped like creatures to show that they have dominion over the earth, the creatures of the earth, and yet they are angelic. Now, this is strange to me. It it still is. What, What do you mean angelic representatives? But actually, when you look at the New Testament especially, you see this thing already mentioned. You've already read passages that talk about it like this. Um, think about this. Um, when you have thrones and powers, evil spiritual rulers, in Ephesians chapter 6, we read this. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the, of the devil because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, and listen to what he says, the rulers the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We cannot see it. We cannot feel it. And yet what we're being taught here is that not only are there evil rulers and thrones and authorities in heaven that oversee their people, there are also good, godly, angelic creatures that oversee and represent the creatures of people here on earth, uh, creatures and people here on earth. Uh, And this is essentially what uh, Malby Babcock's hymn, his famous hymn, is about. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears all nature sings. And around me it rings, the music of the spheres, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white declare their maker's praise. This is a picture, it's happening right now in heaven, that these representatives of all creaturely life on earth are all praising the Lord rightly. Humans, animals, they're all doing as they meant, they were meant to do. Uh, another way to look at it would be in the Lord's Prayer we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what we're seeing here is that creatures here on earth, including and especially humans, do not worship the Lord. But in heaven, their representatives do worship the Lord. And so we're praying in that Lord's Prayer to say, hey, what happens up here, will you please make it happen down here? So it's, it's a foreign idea, but the Lord desires to show it to us. He desired to show it to the first century Christians. Why? They were suffering, right? They were suffering in that first century under Caesar. They had earthquakes in that time. They had famines. They had plagues in that time. They experienced tornadoes and viruses. They even experienced, I'm sure, cancer, sickness, illness, and death. And in a world where you can't see God or heaven, you are tempted to despair, that the Lord isn't present, 
He isn't real. He isn't there. He doesn't care. He's not helping you like he should. You think the Lord gave this vision to them so that they would actually have a sight of him on his throne and all creatures, one day, all nature, praising him just like they are in heaven right now. They need to see his glory, but they need to see his sovereignty over creation. And that's what he shows us in these creatures here. Uh, So that we would develop a trust in God in hard times. We see all creation praising God, and it gives us a trust. So interestingly, Malby Babcock, the guy who wrote This Is My Father's World, when he died, they found his pocket Bible, and on the flap of the the cover was written this, committed myself again with Christian brothers to unreserved docility and devotion before my master. Undeserved quietness and trust of the Lord in any situation before my master. It makes sense that he would write, this is my father's world. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. That is the message of these creatures here. But lastly, we get to these 24 elders. Why are they here? What do they show us? What are they meant to teach us? Uh, We read about them in verse 4, so you can look with me. Around the throne there were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. So already we can kind of gather. These are lesser authorities of some kind. We see their white robes, which is sometimes purity. It symbolizes purity, but sometimes symbolizes kingliness and conquest and authority. So they have white robes on, and they have crowns on their head, which is what kings wear and rulers wear. So essentially they're sub-rulers, But why 24 of them? And what does that tell us? What does that aspect add to this? Well, so there's a couple of places in the Bible that 24 is significant. In the Old Testament, there were 24 uh, classes of priests in the temple. There were 24 gatekeepers uh, in the temple. There were 24 Levitical worship leaders in the temple. But what we're getting from this overall picture is that this has to do with God's people. And it's no coincidence then that there are 12 patriarchs that oversaw the people of God in the Old Testament, and there are 12 apostles that oversaw the people of God in the New Testament. And so what it seems to be here is similar to the creatures. They are angelic beings. They're in heaven with God. Uh, They are rulers, but they're also representatives of all the people of God. They picture... The church in heaven. And again, we ask, why? Because God sees it fit that we would see the complete number of his people in heaven. They're worshiping him. Worshiping him and praising him and giving them his glory. Casting their authority, their crowns down before his feet. To say, in other words... My authority has been given from you, and I give it back to you. I recognize your authority, and I cast my crown before you. You are the true ruler. You are the true leader. But they are heavenly representatives of God's earthly people on earth. Why did he give this? So I was listening to an audio book recently outside in the evening, and the the voice of the bad guy came on. It was kind of scary. I was like, I can't do it. But um, my son, one of my sons heard, and immediately his ears perked up, and he came over kind of nervously or timidly and said, what was that? And I said, oh, it's an audio book, and that was the bad guy's voice. That's why it sounded scary. And uh, what's he doing? Well, he's, the bad guy's trying to get the good guy, and uh, that's what part of the book we're in. And his next question out of his mouth was this. He had to know. Well, who wins? Like, who wins the fight? 
the bad guy or the good guy. Like, I need to know. Uh, it was only going to be okay hearing this scary voice if he knew at the end that the good guy won. This is the answer to that question. Will we make it as God's people? Under the persecution of Caesar, they saw their friends being taken off, dragged off, fed to animals. They saw their children walk away and desert them. Uh, they saw their friends uh, die in various sorts of ways and persecution. And they weren't sure. They could not see this heavenly vision yet. And they saw their own people being taken away. And they wondered, will, will I make it? Will they make it? Will we make it? How do we know? I need to know who wins in the end. Part of the reason why these 24 elders are shown is so that we know that we all make it in the end. There will be the complete body of Christ worshiping the Lord in his presence. And we see that in heaven now. That is this picture here. As we wonder, as you wonder as we go forward this week, whether or not you will make it, look to these 24 elders. Use this vision. And so another pastor is helpfully uh, shared. He helpfully shares how to use this vision and how to make it your own. Listen to what he says. These elders are your representative, believer. Those thrones and crowns and priestly robes are yours. That position around and near the throne of God is yours. Its purity, honor, and power, and nearness to God are yours. Truly, although in part, but if you are his, they'll be yours in full possession. Everything that they represent is yours. That's what you are meant to see from these elders and from the creatures as they worship the Lord God on his throne. Babcock's hymn ends with this. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. The Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. That is the promise of this vision for you. So take it, bring it to, uh, commit it to your heart, to your mind, to your memory. But now in this moment, let's do together what these elders and these creatures do when they see the Lord on his throne. Let's fall down before him and worship him. Let's pray to him now to do that. Lord God, I pray that you would seal this vision to my heart and to our hearts. That it would be central as we walk forward in these last days. No matter what comes in the world or in our lives, Lord, I pray that you would remind us and bring to mind this vision and that you would give us hope. Thank you for being our God and on your throne. Amen. Would you stand as we praise the Lord together in response?